Hey, hey, party people. Welcome to Fashion Illustration Thunderdome. Two will enter, one, okay, maybe not. All right, today in this video, I'm going to go over the same illustration, once in marker, once in paint, trying to get very similar results and dropping some tidbits on illustration how-tos along the way. If you want to color along, I have this illustration as a coloring page in my Etsy store. Link is in the description box below. But just for those of you watching the video, you can download the coloring page for free by going to zoehong.com. Link is also in the description box. On with the markering. So I have my markers here and my mechanical pencils and my erasers, scratch paper. People who are familiar with my videos know that I love to draw on the wrong side of marker paper and render on the right side. I'm using Copic's marker paper because I'm using Copic's today. I'm going to list all the materials used in this video in the description box below. Here's the thing about pencil, regular graphite pencil. It reacts differently to different papers. So, you know, I don't know the perfect science behind all of this, but I do know that on marker paper, the leads show up darker and they smear more. Probably because it's smoother, okay? And so they smear more and everything than on watercolor paper. And when you're watercoloring, you're not pressing very hard onto the paper at all and you press harder with marker not that you're jamming your marker down but you are pressing harder and so because of that pencil smearing i do like to draw on the wrong side and render on the right side of marker paper whereas i'm not super concerned about that with watercolor not that i would know how to do it with watercolor that would be very complicated but I use a light HB.3 size mechanical pencil to do my underdrawing on watercolor paper for painting, and I don't have a ton of smearing problems. Whereas with marker, it's very easy to smear graphite. So this is how I do things. Okay. However, there are times where I use slight pencil lead smearing to my advantage like with these scales. I can see the scales well enough through the paper that I didn't need to draw them first, but I'm kind of smearing the graphite a little bit just to add to the shadows a tiny bit, and then I clean off my marker nibs before I recap them. I'm using a Posca paint pen in white to put in some accents and some sparkle. And the rest of the back of her dress is a very sheer white mesh, and I have videos on how to do shears. I have videos on how to do most of this stuff where I go into it super in-depth and careful and slow. But basically, when you're doing sheer fabrics, I lay down the flesh tone first and make sure that I lay down the flesh tone kind of just softer and lighter than my regular skin tone. So whatever skin tone color I pick, I pick a lighter one to do the under the sheer fabric skin. For those of you wondering, in a really intricate illustration like this with tons of beading and scales and detail and stuff, I do bounce back and forth between intricate pencil line work and softer marker work to prevent hand fatigue. Like if you're doing like tight pencil drawing for a long time straight through, you start getting sloppy because your hand starts getting tired. To prevent that a little bit, I kind of go back and forth, give my hand a break, give my hand different things to do. You know, back and forth, back and forth. Something a lot of people don't think about when they're rendering with marker is you can have brush strokes with marker as well, not just when you're painting. 
And it's especially true when you're working with brush tip markers, but you can create an artful stroke with chisel tips as well. I hate Copic chisel tips, but there are different brands where I do like the chisel tips, such as Prismacolor. Anyway, when you are rendering something really textured like fur, number one, you always have to shadow that texture as well. You can't have big blocky shadows on a soft, gently draped fur with long, shaggy hairs. Okay, it just is not congruent. Secondly, use artful strokes, whether you're using a brush or a marker, to create those textures. I mean, sometimes I like to use a little color pencil to add some texture on top, but you still have to get that texture and movement and drape with your base color. Notice here the skin tone. Her face is not covered by a fabric, and so the skin tone I'm using, the two colors I'm using, are one step darker, so that the exposed skin looks definitively darker than the parts where she's wearing the white mesh. And the fur trim on her helmet is a shorter hair fur than the parts that are on her skirt, and you want to show that in your brush stroke, in your pencil stroke, just make it very clear and obvious that it is a different kind of fur. I go back and forth between my 0.3 and my 0.7 mechanical pencils. I want a softer, hairier, kind of thicker line look for more of my furry things. And then I go back to my point three for a lot of really fine line work like the corset bone casing or the French. Parts of the helmet that have the little swirly stuff. I want the swirly stuff to be very distinct, a pattern that is grooves on the metal. So first of all, it's silver and not white, and so I'm definitely putting in a solid gray instead of just leaving the base white. And then the design elements that are kind of banged out, welded, whatever blacksmithed into the helmet. Where are my verbs? What am I talking about? I don't know anything about metal smithing. Come on, anyway. Those things I want receded into the metal, and so they're going to be a slightly darker gray. For this entire illustration, I use the Copic Cool Gray series from double zero to four. I didn't use anything darker than that, I don't think. No, I used a five for the most darkest elements of the helmet. And I'm going to go in with my Posca paint pen to kind of punch up some highlights, shiny spots, things like that. And of course, this crazy mane coming off the helmet, obeying the rules of hair rendering. I have a whole playlist on hair rendering if you're interested in that. But brushing in the direction of the hair, also using the brush strokes to make it clearly different than the fur on her helmet or the fur on her skirt. So yeah, I don't know anything about armor or helmets or swords or scabbards, so I looked all that stuff up online. Pinterest is your friend, Google is your friend, and uh, my memories of Lord of the Rings, also my friend. And so I designed some stuff, you know, based off of things that I saw, and then I wanted the armor to look like they belong to each other, so I added some of the swirl design. I added strips of leather wrapping around the handle, because I thought, that's good for grip, right? I didn't see it on every single sword, but I thought it would be a nice practical thing uh, in terms of sword handling. Not that I've handled a lot of swords in my day, but I do have some friends who are hella into Renfair stuff, so I have swung very safely some swords. 
And I know the sword is a little big, but I did that on purpose. I wanted her to look like, you know, I'm the queen of whatever tribe this is. And my sword is big, you know, what is it? Speak softly, but carry a big stick. Kind of like that. Like she has a big sword, knows how to use it. Mm -hmm. That's my kind of hero right there. I do have a video on how to render different kinds of pleats. Here I imagined a couple of thick layers of tool done in super skinny, super skinny, super skinny crystal pleats. And with this kind of pleating where it's so tiny, you're not really drawing every single fold. It's just kind of a matter of shadow base, shadow base, shadow base, shadow base, shadow base. Shadow base. So it's just little streaks of gray to get the folds of the little pleats and whatnot. And you can watch that video, the pleats video, I'll link it below in more detail to study different kinds of pleats and uh, study how to render those in more detail. This marker rendering took 52 minutes to complete in real time. And I'm not counting doing the initial underdrawing or any of the rough drafts or anything like that. Just the beginning of when I first laid down marker and started redrawing all the elements off the underdrawing. And that's pretty long for one illustration for me, but you know, that's a lot of like redrawing all the little beads and all the scales and everything. At the same time, I saved a lot of time because I didn't have to paint or marker a lot of the base color because a lot of it is white. On to the painting. As I mentioned before, all materials used are gonna be listed in the description box as well as links to videos I mentioned in this video and other related videos. I have the marker rendering that I just completed in the corner here because I want to make the two illustrations as closely resembling each other as possible so we can kind of compare results that way. Here I'm mixing up my paint. I want all my gray tones to be have the same undertone like the markers did. So I mix up a batch of the darkest color I'm going to use and then use that with varying amounts of water throughout my illustration. And here I'm using Payne's Gray with a little bit of ivory black. I never shadow with straight black unless I'm shadowing black because black by itself tends to look kind of dead. And the Payne's Gray is actually kind of this beautiful navy and it adds like a beautiful cool tone to the gray. So that's what I'm working with for all the shadow tones. And I did mess up a little here. I got a little too trigger happy with the gray. We're gonna make it work. I watered it down, I tried to erase some of it, and then I was like, oh, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get too obsessive about it. We're just gonna make the hair a little grayer than the marker illustration. My technique for painting watercolor is a little bit different from how I work with marker in that you have to wait for paint to dry. And so that kind of dictates some of the workflow. And so I do bounce around a lot more when I'm painting because I have to let layers of paint to dry before I move on to the next thing, unless I'm trying to be blendy. But if I'm trying to put a significantly darker color on top without it blending out too much, I have to wait for the paint to dry, right? So I'll bounce around to another section and paint that. And I don't go to the section next to it because then the paint will start bleeding together, right? So I did the hair, the, the horse hair that goes on the helmet, and then I do the fur on the skirt, and then I go back to the hair, you know, if it's dried a little bit, or if I want it to be a little bit blendier, then I wait for the paint to dry just a little. If I don't want it to be blendy at all, then I wait for the paint to dry complete. And so I bounce around a lot. Now I'm working on the corset lacing. And oh my God, if I never have to draw this corset lacing ever again, oh, it was so tedious. It was so boring. Honestly, there isn't much else to say about the technique because much of the technique is similar to marker. And I say this a lot in my rendering videos, the way I demo it and the way you would paint it versus marker is the same, except with paint, you have to wait for layers of paint to dry in between steps 
unless you're doing a lot of wet on wet blendy stuff. So yeah, there isn't anything really different. I use different brushes. You know, this brush is very skinny and it's synthetic, so it's stiff and it's really nice for these little details. That's what these stiff little skinny synthetic brushes are good for. And then like the soft, uh, beautiful natural hairs are good for, you know, big flowy swaths of color, okay? Like these Escoda brushes, like the one I'm painting with on the screen right now. But yeah, with paint, bounce around, bounce around, okay? Always have an eyedropper handy to fill color with water. Always have a lint-free cloth or a paper towel around to kind of mop up mistakes. Now that the base color of the helmet is dry, I can put in my divots and my shadows, all those good things, all my little swirly things. I had a really good time designing and painting this. And see, I can get those separate hairs and brush strokes in my ponytail only because the base layers had dried. If they had not dried, all the colors would mush up and blend into each other. With something like this wrap around scales around her neck and shoulders, I like to lay out the shadows for the whole piece before I go in with more detail because the scales are pretty flat and so they'll kind of conform to one shadow. The edges of the shadow are gonna be a little bit broken up because the scales have the edges and everything, okay? When you get a little bit dark, you can just kind of mop up some of the color with the clean cloth, okay? Another reason why to always have that cloth around. The beads that sit under the scales, those will be shadowed individually because those are the pearls are 3D and they'll each have their own shadow and highlight. But the scales, they're pretty flat. And you want to make the scales really stand out in a way that they, it doesn't look like just pattern fabric. And the way to do that is when you're drawing them, make sure that there is a distinct kind of like you're drawing each individual scale and you see the separate little scales in the silhouette of the shape of the garment. And then later I will go in and drop in a tiny shadow under each individual scale. Okay, and that's how it's gonna look much more 3D than a pattern fabric. And now we're gonna mix up a little bit of skin tone. I like burnt sienna. You know, every brand's burnt sienna is a little bit different. I like many of them. This one is Paveo. It's a little bit rosier than the Windsor Newton burnt sienna. And I'm adding a little bit of this Linnell Toledo Brown to just kind of tone down the rosiness just a little bit, not make it too ruddy. Okay, just a touch of that Toledo Brown. And again, for the parts that are going under the mesh, the skin tone is going to be soft. It is not going to hit the edges of the pencil perfectly okay, and give a little bit of a halo effect. And then the skin tone on the face is going to be a tone darker than what's under the mesh. And now I'm bouncing around to the dry paint areas, adding details, adding shadows. And then if there are some weird parts where it kind of got splotchy, I take a clean, wet brush and I just kind of blend out some splotchy areas very gently. I am using hot press paper, which means it's much smoother than cold press paper. And I want, I wanted that non-textured look. So I'm kind of rubbing out weird inconsistencies. And now I'm using the little paint pen to add some highlights to my beads. I love these paint pens. If you saw my Buenos Aires uh, haul, you know that now I am the proud owner of four different sizes of these <laughs> paint pens. I really like them. And so far, I like them a lot more than gel pens. Although in honesty, that isn't really saying much because I think a lot of you already know that I 
hate Japan. <laughs> so remember in the beginning of this video when I said that the graphite for some reason shows up much darker on the marker paper than it does the watercolor paper? So I'm switching to a 6B because even the B on the 7.7 mechanical pencil isn't really showing up dark enough for my taste. And I love these Faber-Cassell Jumbo Graphite Pencils. The lead is the same as other pencils. It's just I like the size of the Jumbo Pencils and how they feel in my hand. And I've been using them a ton lately. And yeah, I go back to the point three for really super fine detail work like the French. But I am using the 6B regular pencil to punch out the darkest details that I really want to bring forward all over the illustration. Please give this video a thumbs up if you found it helpful or entertaining. And you know what I'm going to say next? Hashtag practice not magic. Hashtag always be practicing. Hashtag if your first one sucks, you're right on track. Don't forget to visit my Etsy store for this coloring page. And uh, go check out my Amazon storefront for all of my product recommendations for painting supplies and marker illustration supplies. All those links are going to be in the description box below. Let me know in the comments which you prefer, the marker version or the paint. Hope you have some fun coloring this page, and I will see you in the next video.